Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Tom Kligerman. I am the president of the Sir John Soames Museum Foundation Board. Um, tonight starts off an amazing week for us in New York City. This event tonight is just one of five that we're celebrating uh, for the 25th anniversary of the Soane Foundation here in New York City. So we're all very excited. Um, I would like to thank some patrons, our patrons for tonight's lecture. Lucy and Nat Day, I don't know if they're here, um, but Kathy Springhorn and Thomas uh, Dillman are here. So thank you very, very much. The Soane Museum um, in London has hosted a series of talks entitled Great Collectors, and we are now pleased here in New York to um, host them on, uh, on our shores as well. Last year, we launched the series with the Duke of Devonshire in conversation with artist Jakob van der Brugel um, right here at this club. Tonight, we have the distinct honor of having with us collector Christian Levitt um, and also Bruce Boucher. Bruce is the newly appointed director at the Soane Museum, and we welcome him to New York. This is the first time he's been here in this role. Um, Bruce is the 14th director of the Soane, and before this, he was at the University of Virginia's um, Fraley Museum. I would like to now turn over the microphone to Anne Nguyen, who is the director of development at the museum, um, who will say a few words about Chris, who has been a friend of hers for, I understand, a number of years. So, Anne. Thank you. Chris, be prepared. Lots of embarrassing stories. Um, over the last 20 years, Chris has acquired over 2,500 objects. His eclectic art collection ranged from antiquities to the modern day. His passion, or what many people, myself included, call his addiction, led him to open the stunning museum in Mujan, the Mujan Museum of Classical Art. It welcomes over 20,000 visitors per year and rising, and the museum is now one of the main attractions in the area. Chris's love and appreciation of arts lies not only in his collecting, his museum, or his contemporary gallery, Vigo, in Mayfair, in London, but it extends to his philanthropic work. Driven by a deep commitment for research and a sharing of knowledge, Chris is committed to supporting exhibitions across the world, from the BM in London to the Royal Academy. He supports archaeological digs in Egypt and Italy. He supports antiquities research at Wolfson College, Oxford, and the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, where he's just been made a trustee. So they're very, very lucky to have him. And of course, he's very generously supported our endowment at the cell. He would have been in very, a lot of trouble had he not. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Soul Museum launched its Great Collector series in 2010. And believe it or not, Chris was one of our very first speakers then. And six years on, six years on, some of my patrons still talk about his enlightening, his exciting, his dynamic presentation and the masterpiece that is his museum. So yes, six years on, you left an impression, Chris. The pressure's mounting here. <laughs> um, my motto in life is to, to, to care is to share. So when we decided to launch the Great Collectors series in New York, there was no doubt in my mind that we needed to ship Chris over to New York and introduce this very modern day zone to our friends and colleagues here at the foundation in New York. So it gives me enormous um, pleasure to welcome you a brilliant collector, fantastic philanthropist, and my very dear friend, Kristen Levitt. Well, thank you, uh, Tom and Anne. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and welcome, Chris. It's, it's nice to have a chance to talk to you about your extraordinary career as a collector. And in thinking of questions to ask, I was reminded of a book that came out a few years ago by Anne Igonet called A Museum of One's Own which was about the great 19th century uh, collections of Frick, uh, Huntington, uh, and Isabella Stewart Gardner. And I think uh, probably many of us thought those days were past, but in recent years, the idea of creating one's own museum has come back uh, in full force. And so Chris is part of a distinct and select band of people who have 
achieved this vision. And I wanted to start by asking you about uh, how you began collecting, because I think that's always an interesting story for any great collector. So what did you, how did you start, and uh, how did you progress as a collector? Uh, yeah, I, um, well, I started collecting when I was about um, around seven or eight years old. Um, there was a, a coin, a medal shop that opened uh, uh, towards the end of my street, actually, where I lived in, in South End in Essex. And um, as a child, uh, we'd always gone on holidays within England and the UK. We never traveled abroad. Um, and my parents had a fascination with sort of ancient history and, and medieval history. So we'd often go and visit museums like the Ashmolean, uh, like the British Museum. Uh, on holidays, we'd go and visit sort of castles and cathedrals. And um, I think that's where sort of the sense of history started. I mean, I, I can remember on one family holiday when I was about, I guess, about eight or nine, we went to Scarborough in, in Yorkshire in England, and we visited uh, York Minster, the York Castle Museum, the York Railway Museum, uh, Ripon Cathedral, <laughs> and Beverly Minster, all in the same, I guess, sort of seven to ten days. So uh, with sort of schedules like that, as a sort of child growing up, it really sort of absorbs you in sort of the, the, the historic element, element and gives you, you know, a great sort of passion for that. So I've sort of started collecting very cheap sort of coins, Edwardian and Victorian coins, one or two Georgian coins. And I had this compulsion to collect certain types of coins and try and get different years and sort of match them up in my sort of coin album so I could have as many years running as possible and try and get the sort of the ones that I was missing. And I did a similar thing with um, sort of First and Second World War campaign medals, which were also mm -hmm. extremely cheap because there were so many uh, soldiers involved in the various campaigns. So, um, so then I would try and collect campaign medals of, of, of different types, like in the Second World War. For, uh, for different countries, they made campaign medals with stars. So you had kind of the star of France, the star of Italy, the 1939 to 1945 star, you had the Egypt star. So I tried to collect the, uh, the various stars. And then, um, of course, you get into your teens and sports and school and everything else. And then once I got into the financial markets, uh, when I was around 21 and then started sort of making money, um, I'd gone from a sort of compulsion and fixation with collecting when I was small to then compulsion and fixation with sports to a compulsion and fixation again with collecting. Um, as financially that sort of, sort of started to sort of give me the wherewithal. And I moved to Paris in 1995 for just 18 months. And um, I used to sort of walk off my sort of Friday and Saturday night hangovers by uh, by meticulously going around the Louvre all day and trying to read as many labels as I could and work my way around sort of the galleries there and the Musée d'Orsay and the Picasso Museum, the Museum Baudin and the various uh, sort of other sort of museums in Paris. And I sort of educated myself in sort of an art history perspective by reading and, and doing that to a large degree while I was, while I was in, in, in Paris. Um, then I moved to Monaco, lived in Monaco for five years, mm -hmm. and during that period um, sort of got used to visiting auctions and seeing what was at auction and collecting artworks, and I bought a house in London and I was decorating that and buying artworks for the house. And, and so that's kind of how it sort of all got together, but I think the overriding thing for collectors is that there's something inside you that sort of drives you to keep doing this. and. Uh, and um, it's compulsive. I guess some people are compulsive in other areas. Some things are destructive and some things are constructive. And uh, fortunately, this, uh, my compulsion's a, a constructive one. <laughs> so. So what, did you keep the <clears throat> early collection of medals or did you discard them as you got interested in other things? Uh, no, I, I still, still have that collection, actually. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it, you... it's still intact. I mean, uh, I, I don't... Um, I don't really display it, actually. It's still in the original albums, and, uh, and the coin's in the original box, so uh, um, it, doesn't quite, uh, it, it doesn't quite make the mark for my wall space these days, but, uh, but, uh, but no, I still have it, yeah. Well, I think that's a good sign, because um, most collectors 
are loath to part with anything, even mm -hmm. if it's um, the, the first things that they collect. It's like a kind of stones along a path for them. Mm -hmm. But I think now you've really honed your collecting in, in instincts to three areas, as I understand it. One is classical antiquities and armor. Mm. Uh, and then the other is um, contemporary mm. art. So how did you arrive at this uh, interesting juxtaposition of the ancient and the modern? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I have collected in other areas. I mean, I've collected some old masters and, uh, and sort of Baroque sculpture, and um, I've decorated my sort of house in France with sort of um, impressionist drawings and things. but. But yes, certainly where the museum's concerned, um, uh, I keep my sort of main collection of antiquities, and uh, and over the years I've collected anything up to sort of contemporary artworks and sort of interspersed those within the within the museum. Mm -hmm. um, it was around the time that I moved from Monaco to um, back to the UK, which is about 15 years ago now, when I sort of discovered the antiquities market, and um, up until then, I'd always, when I got my sort of catalog lists at the beginning of the year from sort of Christie's and Bonhams and Sotheby's, I'd always overlook the box for antiquities. And um, I wasn't even quite sure what they meant by antiquities, even though um, I'd often read a lot about sort of Greek and Roman battles and Greek and Roman history. And um, I thought, well, that could mean almost anything. You know, it could mean sort of medieval sculpture or whatever. And um, so I ticked these boxes this one year and then when I started getting these antiquity catalogues coming through, I thought that that was literally the ultimate in collecting, that you could own a Greek battle helmet or, a, or a, you know, a Roman bust. And, um, and also there was a, an armor collection that started coming on the market at the time uh, from a chap called Axel Gutmann, who was a, a German chap based in Frankfurt who had been collecting ancient armor from the early 1970s to the year 2001 when he died. Mm -hmm. So he built sort of a 30-year collection, and then his family just started liquidating it en masse through the various auction houses and, uh, and dealers. And um, I'd always been fascinated with ancient military and had collected some Cromwellian armor and some uh, 100 Years' War armor um, and arms. And um, so when this collection started to hit the market, I thought that was, that was quite interesting to collect ancient as well, that previously I had no idea was even marketable or, or and I just became absolutely manic about collecting antiquities and built this huge sort of collection that was just stacking up in in storage and um, and I thought to myself as I was bought it I thought well I'll put this piece in the house at, at some point and then I thought well I'll, that piece kind of goes with that and I started buying artworks with classical themes because I thought well you know there's a Matisse drawing of of Caracalla that he drew when he was younger, and there's a bust on the market at Bonhams of Caracalla. Those two at home would look, you know, amazing together, and um, and you know, an Eve Klein torso would look amazing <laughs> against a torso of Aphrodite, an original Roman one. But then all these things were sort of stacking up in storage, and I ended up with with sort of warehouses full of it, and then um, and then um, by 2009, sort of uh, seven or eight years later. I thought to myself, well, I know I've bought a lot of world-class pieces, um, and, uh, and uh, mostly with, with fantastic provenance. And um, so I thought, you know, these are things that, that, that maybe, uh, you know, the public should see. And actually, I thought to myself, a lot of these pieces that I've bought haven't seen the light of day since, since I bought them, and i sort of quite like to see them again myself, for that matter. <laughs> <coughs> so... Um, so then uh, I spoke to a few people, and it's funny, you know, when you're collecting yourself, you don't really, you buy what you like, but you don't buy because you think someone else might sort of like it, you know, and you apply all those elements to collecting when you're buying, like, you know, when you're sort of, I guess, sort of a professional collector, if there is such a word, like condition of the piece, provenance of the piece, whether or not it's even real, attribution, whether or not it is what it's supposed to be, um, quality of the piece, um, price point of the piece, collectability of it, academic interest in it, does it add anything to classical history or art history, you know, is it telling us something we don't already know, 
Um, so I'd applied all those methods um, and, um, and by default ended up with a collection that actually then people were really interested in, in, in looking at. So actually if I can yes. sort of show you maybe a few slides of, of the museum and some of the things in the collection actually then. Um, so this is the back of the museum. The museum's um, in Mougin, in, uh, which is a medieval village in the south of France. Um, about two or three kilometers north of Cannes. And um, this is sort of, it's over four floors. Um, you can just see the back of the museum there with, with two Anthony Gormley statues on the back uh, facing each other and sort of in the guise of Narcissus. <coughs> um, so this is the first floor. So there's the basement, which is the Egyptian gallery, ground floor, first floor, and then the second floor is the armory. Um, so I've amassed the pri largest private collection of ancient armor in the world, which a lot has largely come from the Gutmann collection that was collected over 30 years plus what I've added to it over the last sort of 15. Um, so in this particular picture of this particular gallery, you can really see how um, the sort of classical period has, has influenced uh, artists during the modern period. And there, in fact, in the, in the central um, vitrine there, you have a 2,000-year-old Roman statue of Aphrodite, second from the left, next to Eve Klein's Aphrodite, 1962. Uh, on the background, you've got um, a screen print of Warhol's Botticelli's Venus. Uh, on the far right, you've got a, a white-painted bronze by Salvador Dali of uh, Aphrodite as a giraffe. Um, and actually, subsequent to that picture being taken, there's now a small drawing by Cezanne of the Venus de Milo in there. And then you've got um, three other small Roman depictions of, uh, of Aphrodite as well. Um, to the right of that, behind the vitrine, you've got a, a Marc Chagall uh, Bacchanalia uh, gouache. On the far right, it's an André Masson. Um, it's an um, Amazon riding a horse. Uh, in the foreground, you've got the Beth Charm bust, um, which is um, a jewel head of uh, Barkus and Janus, um, was brought uh, to the UK in, in 1925 from Palestine by a, a captain in the army and was in a, um, a stately home in, in the UK for the last uh, sort of 80 or 90 years. So that's uh, one where we sort of They've used the museum now to sort of collect extra pieces and sh really show how the classical period has influenced artists in, in the more modern period. Um, in this picture here, it shows you the sort of ground floor, sculptures, ground floor sculpture gallery, actually, before it was fully set up. This was actually when it was still in the making. Um, the sculpture on the right is the Cobham Hall Hadrian, uh, which has an 18th century provenance, and uh, which actually I bought at Christie's in 2009. It came from Cobham Hall in Kent in England. The statue on the left is Domitia, um, Domitian's wife, uh, in the guise of the, the deity Demeter, which um, was the accession from the Lichten, royal family of Lichtenstein collection. Um, now, here's a modern versus the ancient uh, set up here. There's uh, a Mark Quinn in the front, the British YBA artist, who um, did a series of, um, of people with sort of personal disadvantages. This is a blind man, Bill Waters, uh, and a marble head of his. And um, interestingly, Mark Quinn collects antiquities himself. So it's kind of interesting how Bill Waters had a sort of Julio Claudian haircut and marks put him on a, on a sort of Roman plinth uh, interspersed amongst original marble, Roman marble heads. Uh, in this cabinet, we have three Roman bronzes in the background. Um, and in the foreground, um, we have a Damien Hurst uh, spin-painted happy head. Um, and the connection there with the classical period um, is that there was an exhibition in the British Museum in 2009 of um, Mark Quinn, Anthony Gormley, and Damien Hurst. And Damien Hurst um, made a sort of setup of 200 of these uh, sort of spin-painted happy head skulls, of which that's one, so it's a British Museum connection. Um, the little 
ceramic in the foreground on the right is a uh, Picasso ceramic um, of Jacqueline. And um, Picasso lived in Mujan for the last 12 years of his life and died there. So it's nice to have a sort of Picasso connection there. Um, so the head that's there on the far right, um, to talk a little bit more about some of the antiquities in the collection, uh, this was found in Rome in 1880 during a church excavation, so we need know the exact church and the road where this was found. There's two other bronze heads found at the same time. It's uh, a head of Augustus, was published in the late 19th century and again in the early 20th century. Um, and this was loaned to an exhibition at the museum in Cologne, actually, um, either two or three years ago, so that's, that's quite a nice piece. Um, this is the Egyptian gallery here. Uh, it's hard to see, but... In the vitrine on the far right-hand side, halfway down, is an Alexander Calder, uh, sort of one of his sort of 1970s uh, watercolors, and it's got pyramids in it amongst the various Egyptian sarcophagi and cartonage masks. Uh, this is one of the most important things in the museum. Um, it's an Egyptian sarcophagus, 1000 BC. Um, this came from actually a Swedish collection, and. Uh, was published in 1925 um, and then actually ended up in a collection um, in the 1980s. It was sold at Sotheby's in 1984 and then uh, ended up in a collection in Dallas. And then I bought it through a New York dealer um, I think in 2009. But it's particularly unusual to have both the back and the front of the sarcophagus and for the sarcophagus to be decorated uh, internally as well as externally. So that's a really important thing. Um, this is one of the vitrines from the, um, from the armory, uh, <laughs> depicting a chronology of helmets from uh, sort of ancient Corinthian and, and Illyrian helmets through to, um, through to uh, Roman uh, period helmets, sort of uh, first to third century AD. This is one of those Roman helmets. Uh, we loaned this to um, the Brunswick Museum in Germany two years ago for a uh, Roman cavalry exhibition there. Um, it's a particularly nice cavalry helmet. Um, this um, is a, uh, a Roman gilded uh, bronze statue of Mercury. This we loaned to the Royal Academy Bronze Exhibition five years ago. Um, it was discovered in France in 1810, so we have the provenance going back to 1810. And um, this is a particularly interesting one, actually. This is the Crow Hall Urn. Um, and Christie's did a house sale of Crow Hall, which is a... Uh, a um, stately British English stately home near Bath, and um, as they were going around the house, sort of um, examining the furniture and, and various sort of paintings and things, someone noticed this, and it had a hole drilled through the bottom and through the lid at the top, and a big orange lamp lampshade put on on the top of it. <laughs> at some point in the 1970s, and. Um, so someone from Christie's obviously thought, well, actually, that looks like a Roman cinnery urn and, and quite a good one. So, um, so they had experts look at it, and, um, and then they sold it at Christie's, and it went to, uh, which I, I missed, and it was bought by a dealer, and I bought it off them at, uh, at Maastricht. Uh, and um, the dealer had subsequently found out, actually, that the vase had been etched by uh, Perinacy, um, around 1760, 1770, that the lid was actually made in the 18th century by Cavaceppi, but the, the vase is Roman. The contents of the vase were noted on the etching by Piranesi. And um, it was interesting that he also noted that the, that the top was by Cavaceppi. So that's actually a tremendously important piece with, with phenomenal provenance that, um, that six or seven years ago had a large orange hat on top of it. So... Uh, <laughs> So, um, so yeah, so, so that's really um, how the museum's developed and the kind of things that you can sort of <coughs> see in it, really. So who, who was your architect for this? Um, well, there was an architect for the building, mm. and there was a group that sort of did the museum design. Mm. Um, the architect for the building was a local English architect called David Price. Um, so the building is a medieval building and originally was a prison for the village, uh, actually. And, um, but it had been turned into a mill at some point in the 18th or 19th century um, because Mujan's close to the village of Grasse and Grasse is, for two, three hundred years, has been the sort of 
center of perfume making in Europe. And Mugin, up until the last 50 years, used to grow a lot of the flowers for the perfumeries in, 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 in grass. Um, subsequently to that sort of industry tailing off, I guess grass probably buys the flowers in Holland and places these days where they mass produce them more. Um, it was then turned into a house in the 1950s, so absolutely all original features, be they from the, the mill or before as a prison at that point, were completely stripped out. So when I bought the building, it was just this giant house full of prefabricated walls, so it was easy just to turn it back into a box, divide it up into four floors and, and turn it into a museum. And the company that we used actually was a company called Event Limited and another company called Chameleon. And um, they do sort of modernizations of galleries and things in museums. And they've just recently done a revamp of the Roman Museum in Bath, actually. So that was, that was quite apt. And so we, we use them. Yeah. I see a lot of <coughs> Sonian uh, resonances here, particularly the fragments, uh, the juxtaposition of ancient and contemporary, as Sohn did. He was uh, very insistent on buying the best of contemporary art and juxtaposing it often with um, ancient. Um, and I liked the idea of having the Mark Quinn in the center of the Roman bust because I've often found it going to look at uh, ancient galleries, it's very difficult to uh, animate a series of classical busts. But I think having something modern in the center really plays off the heritage that uh, Quinn is tapping into. Mm. So I think it's a, it's a very effective uh, way of doing it. And obviously, when you were um, thinking about how you were going to lay out your museum, you must have traveled a lot, looked at museums. And mm. I was wondering if there's any museum that you have seen in the last few years that particularly had resonance for you as a collector? Well, there's, lo there's lots of museums that, that certainly do that. I mean, the, in, a, in, a, in a more, um, how can I put it, a spectacular way, the Frick here in New York takes some, takes some beating, of course, and um, actually I was chatting to the chap earlier tonight about the Frick, and, and um, one thing that's, that's key when you visit that museum is that he collected across different spheres, from mm. furniture to, to early Renaissance old masters through to you know, sort of 18th, 19th century works. And, um, and as you walk around, you see Renaissance bronzes, you see Baroque bronzes. And um, he was clearly um, had an amazing eye for lots of different kinds of artwork from from sort of lots of different periods. I think in terms of a museum, actually, that I've seen just recently that um, that I found tremendously exciting. Actually, was just this summer I visited the the New Acropolis Museum for the first time that that opened in two thousand and nine, um, and. So the Greeks have, have, have built this incredible museum and it's just beside the Acropolis. They excavated a huge area to, to build the museum um, where they discovered quite naturally with it being next to the Acropolis, a huge area of, of houses. So they excavated professionally, obviously, the archaeology. They found an absolutely astounding amount, it seems to me, of, of Greek vases and, and Greek pottery. So they then built the museum on stilts, so it rises above the archaeology below it. Mm. The ground floor is mostly glass, so you, as you walk over the ground floor, you then look down mm -hmm. on these sort of streets and houses that are sort of two, two and a half thousand years old. All the pottery that they found and everything that they found in the houses is then in the first galleries you walk through into the museum. I mean, I don't know how many pieces there are, but I mean, dozens and dozens of them. Mm -hmm many of them in incredible condition. So that's fascinating in itself. Before you even got into the museum, that you, to see the stuff that you actually turned up to really see. And then on the upper floor, they've built um, a sort of structure that is the exact size of the top of the Acropolis itself. And the remaining Parthenon marbles that, that were there in Greece, they put around this piece, which is the, you know, the, the sort of the exact size of, as I say, the, the, the top of the Parthenon. 
And next to all these pieces, they've put where the pieces that are in the British Museum are alongside it. So they've done a complete mock-up of, uh, of what the, the, the top freeze of the Parthenon would have looked like originally. And of course, it's their major claim to try and, and, uh, and get the Elgin stroke Parthenon marbles back. And, um, you know, good luck with that. But, um, Dream on. Yeah, but um, that, I thought, was absolutely fascinating. And um, actually, when you look at the, uh, the Acropolis and the Parthenon, so the, the temple to the left of the Parthenon um, is the Temple of Poseidon. And there's five out of what would have been originally six caryatids that hold up the front of that temple. Um, so they've made copies of those to be outside because obviously they're being damaged by the weather, weather. And the original five remaining ones are inside the museum. So when you see those in the museum sort of lined up in the, as they would be outside on the Temple of Poseidon, they look absolutely amazing. With one notable missing one that is again in the British Museum. <laughs> So uh, when I look at that, it is a bit of a shame that that is in the British Museum because it doesn't really do much extra for the British Museum. It would actually look a lot better, actually, uh, if it was in Greece. And I never thought, having the connection with the British Museum that I have and being a patron there and, and supporting their events, et cetera, that, that um, I think, oh, well, you know, this should be back in, its, you know, back in Greece. But um, I have to say, with that particular piece, that it's hard not to... <laughs> Not to think that, you know. So um, I think it'd be the thin end of the wedge. So. Well, that's that, you know, that's the thing, and uh, so so, and that's not something that I kind of want to get into, of course. But uh, and I, I, I support the British Museum in their in their views and activities, but uh, but it's just something that crossed my sure. crossed my mind at the time. I know. Well, um, tell me. Often um, collectors have a story about the one that got away, something that they didn't get for whatever reason, and uh, they always come back to it. It's sort of in the back of their mind. And do you have any stories like that? Yeah, yeah, I have a few, actually. <laughs> um, there's, I mean, first and foremost, when I, when I buy something, I always have a fixed idea in my mind as to what I think a reasonable value is for it. I never really like to overpay for something. And, and I know that sounds kind of strange, particularly with antiquities, where every single piece is unique and you never really know what's going to turn up in the market. But you, but you sort of get a sense of value over time. So generally at auction, I don't tend to chase things. I'll, I'll leave an absentee bid, and if I get it, I get it. And if I don't, you know, I try not to lose any sleep over it. Um, but there's been a couple of things at auction in the last few years. <coughs> Sorry, it's uh, perfect timing to get a cough. Um, that, and getting away from, from antiquities, <coughs> that, um, <coughs> that have escaped me. Uh, one of which was a painting um, by Picasso that was at Christie's in London a few years ago, about four or five years ago now, that he painted <coughs> when he was 13. And in his teens, he painted portraits of people. And in his teens, he could paint like a grand master. And um, I'd seen several paintings by him over time that he painted when he was about sort of 16 or 17. <clears throat> this one he painted when he was 13. And I thought that was absolutely unbelievable. And it was a portrait of a man wearing a sort of <clears throat> towel around his head that looked a bit like a tea cloth. It, was, it wasn't a turban, but it sort of looked a little bit like that. And um, the estimate on it, I think, was around 150 to 200,000 pounds. And I thought that in art history terms, the value of this thing was substantially higher than that. Um, and uh, so I went to see it because I thought, well, maybe there's something wrong with the condition or whatever. And generally, interestingly, his very early works, on the rare occasions when they come up, actually don't really trade for that much money, not much more than, than a sort of half-decent drawing from one of his notepads. And, um, you know, it checked out. And I, I said to the girl, I said, you know, you've put quite a low estimate on this. And she said, well, nobody really bothers about the really early works. They're not the sort of collectible ones. And I thought, well, God, like one that he painted when he was 13, surely anyone that, 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 that you know, would pay, you know, $5 million, let alone, you know, $100 million for Picasso would be interested to have that, at least from an academic perspective. 
apart from the fact it was actually a really nice painting. And uh, um, so, you know, I don't collect Picasso particularly, but um, so I bid that up to uh, about 800,000 pounds and that ended up going for, I think, well over two million. So, you know, so that was kind of interesting. And then actually around the same time, there was a painting that came up at Christie's again at King Street in London um, by Francesco Melzi. And um, I always find old masters tricky because attribution with Renaissance old masters is always particularly difficult. And if someone says a painting's by Botticelli, I mean, if it's completely by Botticelli and the provenance is amazing, it's worth $50 million. If it's Botticelli in studio, but he appears to have painted the bulk of the figures, it's $5 million. If, it's, if he's barely touched it, it's worth 50 grand kind of thing. You know, so, so you know, you're never quite sure whether you're buying something that's worth 50,000 or 5 million or something in between the two. Or quite, you, I find the old master's market actually quite tricky when you're getting into those kind of early Renaissance works. But there was a painting came up by Francesco Melzi who was um, one of Leonardo da Vinci's main pupils and traveled with him to both Milan and France. And Meltz's works are particularly, uh, particularly rare. And also, in his better paintings, he did paint quite a bit like da Vinci. I mean, his, his other pupils, like Gian Petrino, also did that, where you have, I could always forget the Italian word for it, but a slightly sort of hazy sumato yeah mm -hmm. which, which means they have a slightly sort of hazy um, look to them Total nuance. right the, yeah. and um, and when you look at Gian Petrino who was one of his pupils they always look slightly stilted but Melzi when he got it right painted a lot like da Vinci <coughs> and um, so this one came up and I went to see it and Again, the estimate was, was around a, a sort of uh, about 120 to 180,000 pounds. And I've often thought that the pupils of the grandmasters were, were too cheap versus the, uh, versus the grandmasters themselves, which, of course, in the case of da Vinci, you know, are, are unviable, notwithstanding the Salvatore Mundi that turned up a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But, but um, so I thought, God, for a Melzi, and it actually looks quite a lot like a da Vinci. I'm not... Not that it was, but, but you know, it's, it's a, an amazing piece of sort of art history. You know, I thought that was, again, you know, sort of attractive value. So um, I bid that up to about £850,000 and, and, uh, and then sort of left it. And it went for 80, one bid higher. And um, so I asked the girls afterwards, I said, oh, you know, um, you know, what would, the, what would the chap on the other side have paid? And they said, actually, it was a, a wealthy American collector, interest, interestingly, who, who, who mostly collected Renaissance portraits. Mm. And he would have paid absolutely any money for it. So, so, uh, um, so obviously, he spotted the value in it as well. And, and I just saved him probably, <laughs> probably <laughs> a, few, a few bids higher. But it, it looked like I, I was clearly never going to end up with that. Um, there was actually one other one that sticks in my mind, which was a Cretan helmet that sold at Christie's. There's only two known, and this is the better one of the two. And um, I got outbid on that by, uh, um, slightly annoyingly, uh, someone who I got to know quite well has, has sort of become a friend, but he mostly collects uh, first century and second century uh, uh, Roman um, antiquities, and this was an 8th century BC, very rare Cretan helmet that had a, what I thought was already quite a high estimate on it of two to 300,000, and he outbid me on that at about 800, and I let it go. And now he wants to sell it back to me for $3 million. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the answer to that is, is, is no, and, uh, and my... I'm slightly annoyed that he had the, that he bid it up so high anyway. So 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 uh, that's sort of yeah. I'm just not very pleased mm. about that. But, oh, but obviously, seeing this as a friend, you, I'll forgive him. You have good instincts because um, the ones that got away got away for a major price. Or and it's interesting about the Picasso because you're right. It's 
perfectly, you know, for, for a, a musical prodigy like Mozart, something that he wrote when he was 12 or 13 would be considered a serious piece of music, but it's very rare for an artist, except for someone like Parmigianino, a few of that kind, that you get something from a teenage artist mm. that's really uh, that striking. So, and, and where, is, where is that painting now, do you know? Uh, I don't know. Mm. I don't know who bought it or, or, or where it went. Disappeared so, like, into Switzerland. Um, Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, but uh, no, it'd be interesting to find out, actually. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's often the case, actually, with, with the, the sort of the 20th century masters, the, 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 the earliest works uh, um, are considered that they were sort of in their developmental phase rather than, uh, than being sort of important from an art history perspective and, and are often, mm. you know, a lot less than their later works, you know, the tiny fraction. Well, I suppose your Cezanne drawing and the Matisse drawing have fallen into that category, don't they? Because they're academic studies, in a sense, the Caracalla. A absolutely. And the, the Cezanne, what was the subject of the Cezanne? Uh, the Cezanne was the Venus de Milo. I yeah. see. Was, was that uh, from the 1860s or...? Um, one of those exactly. early, because he did a number, an there are a few academic, yeah. unrecognizable as Cezanne per se, that um, well, It must I've have seen. been around that, the, yeah. that date, yeah. Mm. And the Matisse one is, 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 is a very early drawing and sort of quite definite for, mm. for Matisse. So yeah, it would have been an academic piece and, um, and um, well, the Emperor Caracalla, who was a rather mean military emperor who who was initially ruling jointly with his brother and then he killed his brother so that he could solely rule. Shows the quality of the, the human being there. And um, he, uh, he had this series of effigies made of himself with this kind of big scowl on his face that was sort of sent out around the empire. And I have one in the, uh, in the Museum Museum. There's also one in the Louvre. So mm. we suspect that Matisse drew the one in, in, the, Louvre, in yeah. the Louvre. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. So, and you have a curator now, is that true? Uh, yeah, we've had one from the, from the beginning. Mm. So the, the museum opened in 2011. Mm. Um, but I appointed a cu curator in 2009 who was a chap called Mark Moroni who um, had a PhD from Wolfson College in Oxford in uh, Roman mosaics. And I knew him because he was the editor of Minerva magazine, which is an archaeology magazine which had been going for sort of 20 years at that point. And subsequently, I, I bought it in 2010. Mm. And um, so he became a friend, and I thought that he would be a good person. He's very sort of sociable and has sort of good connections with museums and universities in the UK, in particular in the US. And um, so he moved to Mijan during the sort of the start of the development of the museum in 2009. Um, and then we opened in 2011. He left in 2014, and um, we appointed a new curator then. Uh, Katia Schuller, who's been with us now for sort of two years, only now she's off on maternity leave for uh, <laughs> for several months. So, uh, so no, we, you know, we, uh, but she's been actually excellent because she has fantastic connections with the universities uh, in France and uh, museums around um, around Europe. So um, she's secured several loans to the Rome Museum in Arles um, to. Um, Various museums, uh, sort of smaller ones around uh, around in France, but she secured loans to Cologne mm. uh, and to Brunswick, and um, she's been in charge of loans actually, which have gone up, going up to Hadrian's Wall next year. Mm. Um, actually, I've had a permanent stuff on loans to the Tully House Museum in Hadrian's uh, in Carlisle, close to Hadrian's Wall as well. Uh, Mark arranged loans. We had a marble head of Odysseus with a 18th century provenance that went to Baltimore uh, on loan and that also went to God, that also went to a foundation in the US, I forget which one now, quite mm. badly. We've had uh, Modigliani drawings go on loan uh, to London to a small museum in, in Islington called the Historic Collection. We had a 17th century statue of um, of Marcus Aurelius on a horse, uh, loaned to Venice last year to the Prado exhibition mm. there. Um, yeah, impressive. we have we have yeah. stuff sort of going out all over mm. the place now. Yeah, we we make several loans a year. Yeah, I have two helmets going on loan to the Met actually um, um, from September next year on three-year loans. Um, mm. 
And I have things for my personal collections as well on loan. I have a three pieces on loan to the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, a sort of 30 ton Ai Weiwei iron tree, oh, yes. and two large Mark Quinn sculptures. Uh, I've got a Anselm Kiefer on loan to Wolfson College in Oxford. Um, I've also got a Gormley on loan there, and um, something else I forget. How do you keep track of it all? <laughs> um, well, the girls in the museum keep track of the museum <laughs> loans. Um, the, uh, and then I have um, someone that helps me with the loans for my sort of personal collection or stuff mm. that I have in storage. So, mm. so sometimes, I, you know, I buy sort of contemporary or 20th century things and the house is full in London, the house is full in Mujan. I own a chalet business in Courchevel. I have three chalets in Courchevel, which I've got them stuffed with contemporary artworks. So now I figure that if I'm buying 20th century or, or contemporary, mm. There should be an investment theme to the later things now, because they're, otherwise they're just stacking up in storage and, and doing nothing. So I like the idea of if there's something that I particularly want to buy, it's a particularly good thing. I'll try and loan it then for a period of years, mm. for three, five years, so at least other people can, sure. can see it instead of it's just sort of sitting there doing nothing. Mm. And unfortunately, my compulsion still leads me to keep buying things, <laughs> even, though, even though I've got nowhere to put them. Well, so, I think that's uh, a sign of a true collector. And I was just wondering, uh, before we close, if uh, would you entertain a question yeah, from absolutely, the Absolutely, yeah, if no problem, yeah. out there would like to ask a question of Chris? Uh, Tom. How often do you sell pieces, or do you sell them, and what makes you sell something? Uh, well, antiquity-wise, I mean, I wouldn't sell anything antiquity-wise other than I had a sort of small group of things to sell. Um, sort of last year or so, where I had things in storage that were not ever going to go in the museum. The early purchases weren't quite sort of high enough quality. So there just didn't seem to be any point storing them anymore. It was just better to sort of put them in auction or sell them to a few dealers so that other people could actually you know, have the chance to enjoy them. Um, but I own an art gallery in London called Vigo, uh, which is on Daring Street, just off of Bond Street. Mm -hmm. And um, initially that started because I bought um, several contemporary works from uh, a chap that was just setting that up, who had set up the Contemporary Art Department of the Fine Arts Society in London about sort of 15 years ago. And he wanted someone to sort of back him. And I thought that was kind of interesting uh, in the contemporary space. And I wanted to learn more about the contemporary space and maybe invest a little bit there. Um, and subsequently, that gallery is done amazingly. And um, we represent artists, uh, for example, like Ibrahim El Salahi, who had a show at Tate Modern three years ago. There's a Sudanese artist that set up a, an art school in Khartoum in the 1960s. Yeah. And um, in a contemporary art market that's just dying for Middle Eastern or African artists, he has that crossover. And he was the minister, I think, for culture in Sudan in the 1970s, and then he was imprisoned. And, you know, you have this sort of whole body of work going back to going back to the 60s, and he hadn't had a major dealer sort of represent him, so we've represented him, um, and uh, we represent artists like Marcus Harvey, who's one of the, the YBA artists, like again like Mark Quinn or Damien Hurst or Tracy Emin, and his prices have had a bit of a lull in the last sort of 10 or 15 years. He um, until we sort of picked him up about four or five years ago. But he's a very interesting sort of YBA artist, actually has his own um, art school in South London called Terps Banana, of all things, where you can go and do a master's in, in contemporary art. And um, in the 90s, actually, was one of the, the more famous YBAs for um, several pieces that he did, including actually one that's the, the caused a riot at the Royal Academy actually during the, the sensation show, which was a, um, a painting of the child killer, Myra Hindley, that was made out of child's handprints. And, um, and then he went through a bit of a lull and, and sort of we picked him up uh, in recent years. And, um, and you know, he's one of our, our main artists uh, now. And he's, you know, I think one of the best of the YBAs. And, um, and there's other artists that we, we sort of promote as well that are sort of young up and coming artists that we believe are doing something, something new and interesting. And having been open just five years though now, we have stands in Freeze Masters and, and uh, Freeze New York, Art Basel Miami, uh, Art Dubai. So 
Um, and as well as that being a commercial venture, you know, we trade contemporary artworks on the side as well, uh, sort of late 20th and, and uh, 21st century artworks. So, so I am involved commercially now in the contemporary world. Um, and if I buy a 20th century artwork, um, sort of mid 20th century, then I do buy it with somewhat of an investment hat on. Um, because it will go into storage and it might sit there for some time and then it might never sort of end up on the wall. Um, but I don't look at uh, anything that's in the museum commercially at all. And um, uh, so, um, so I wouldn't ever enter the commercially the, the antiquity space. Oh, I mean, it's my, my heart, definitely. You know, I mean, I've just been doing it since I was a kid, so I think, think the, um, you know, the collecting gene is, is, is a strong one. And um, otherwise, uh, you know, otherwise maybe I would have gone into, into dealing at some point in, in art. And, well, I mean, maybe I'm slightly on the fringes of that with my partner sort of running the contemporary gallery or whatever. But, but, um, but no, it's, it's, it's the heart first, but... You know, when you're collecting anything, and particularly antiquities, you know, your head has to be a part of it because, <laughs> you know, you, you, you can't see something fantastic and yet it has no provenance and then your heart takes over your head. You know, your head has to, has to come into it and, and stop you somewhere along the line so you don't end up with, uh, with a collection of, of poorly provenance material or poorly researched materials. So, so a bit of both, but uh, heart first, but the head has to, has to definitely be in there. Well, I think that's probably a good... Point to uh, end on. No, we have one more question. Oh, one more question. Sorry. Yes. I, yes. Remember, so you're British. Why Mouchin? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, um, when I moved back from Monaco to uh, to London in 2002, I wanted to very much keep a base in the south of France, and I have other family. Actually, one of my brothers lives in the south of France. It's been there 20 years. And um, I particularly like Mujan for, for a number of reasons. I mean, apart from the fact that it's a beautiful village, it has a, uh, a tremendous art history. Um, so I think, as I mentioned before, Picasso spent the last 12 years of his life living in Mujan and died there. Uh, Francis Picabia lived in Mujan. Uh, Man Ray lived in Mujan. Jacques Cocteau lived in Mujan. Uh, briefly, uh, Leger had a studio there, although he's mainly based in, 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 in and around Biot. So um, and it has a great culinary history, actually, as well. Um, Roger Verger, who was one of the top chefs in the world in the 70s and 80s, um, had a restaurant there in fact, into the 90s. In fact, it's where Elizabeth Taylor started her Amphile party um, during the Cannes Film Festival uh, back in the 90s, which subsequently now is at the, the Hotel uh, Eden Rock. Uh, but Alan Ducasse started his career um, in one of Roger Verger's restaurants uh, in 1977 in Mujan. So, um, so it has this thoroughfare of, of visitors anyway, both with a sort of art history background and a culinary background. And um, like many of the towns and hills in the sort of south of France, they were, they were uh, inhabited during the Roman period. And, um, and in fact, actually, uh, Nice, on Tibes and Marseille were, were Greek trading colonies as well, uh, originally. So, uh, and I didn't, I mean, I thought about setting it up in London, but um, I wasn't sure initially that, that the collection was sort of important enough to be shown alongside collections like, like the Sone at the time. I didn't have that sort of level of con confidence in it. I didn't know whether, you know, we'd get thousands or tens of thousands of visitors or, or whether or not it would be sort of three men and a dog, so I didn't want to set it up in London, and, and it potentially looked, look, looked silly. I mean, as it's turned out, uh, we won the 2011 Apollo Magazine New Museum of the Year opening award out of 11 museums around the world that opened that year, all major galleries. Um, in 2013, we were nominated for European Museum of the Year, uh, the only museum in France nominated that year. We've won two French cultural awards, one given by the Louvre. So, uh, so me being a little bit kind of nervous about whether or not, <laughs> whether or not I, I sh you know, my, my collection was of public quality, um, you know, those views were unfounded. So, 
as it's turned out. So, but I, I put it in Mijan and not in London, and, and, and that's where it sits, I suppose. Better climate. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's much warmer down there. So one, there's another question. Given that you have so much historic you can throw it in another museum. <laughs> Uh, I'm not. I, I'm not sure I would do that. Um, I don't know. How, certainly on the antiquities side, I don't have enough in storage to to open a, another museum. But I mean, art-wise, I don't. I mean, I don't think I have enough contemporary and 20th century art in storage either to open another. So while I've got a lot in storage, not enough to to do a dedicated museum like like I did with this. Um, and that's why I think the key pieces, I'm much happier to put them out on sort of, you know, long-term loans, three, five years, and you're lots of loans of exhibitions when they come up uh, on a temporary basis as well, of course. So, yeah, there's not enough to, to do another museum, and, um, yeah, I'm not sure I want the work of that again, <laughs> setting that up. <laughs> yeah. Right, sorry, and another question. This will be the last one. The last question. Yes. Which is your favourite In the museum? Uh, well, funnily enough, um, and not one that, that, that I put up, I have a, uh, a fragment of a Greek breastplate, um, dates about the 4th century BC, and on the front of it is inscribed, To Athena, loot from the enemy. So it's... it's one Greek hoplite soldier has killed another, picked this up after the battle, and then dedicated it to, um, to the goddess Athena. So, um, <laughs> would I give it to the Acropolis Museum? No. <laughs> uh, no, no, I wouldn't, no. I'm quite happy for that to sit in my museum. And... Uh, and as far as I'm aware, it doesn't come from the Acropolis, so, uh, so, so there's no reason for it, for it to be in the Acropolis Museum, which warehouses things from the Acropolis. So, uh, so no. No, that's going nowhere. <laughs> I think that's a good point to end it. Uh, uh, we have a reception now, so we can, uh, you can talk to Chris some more, and, but please join me in thanking him for sharing his thoughts.